I think we're at a really critical time in how we as a nation manage fire and um, what we've seen is incredible impacts from our continued you know, use of fire suppression as, as our primary management tool. Well, ceremonial burning practices um, at the landscape scale um, stopped in about 1911 after the Weeks Act and um, some of the historic documentation says that they weren't really effective at stopping a lot of those burns until about 1932. But you know, some families have continued to use fire and you know, right around their, their homes, um, you know, at, the right, at just a smaller scales. And so some, a lot of, of vital information about the why and the where and how have been passed on. Um, it's just time to bring it back into practice at a landscape scale. We will have fires. This is a Mediterranean climate. We have a, every year we have a drought, no matter how much precip you get. And by the time August rolls around, everything out there will burn. And so you just got to figure that's going to happen sometime, sooner or later. Um, like this year, Santa Rosa, and, and I mean, the various places, it, it happens. And you just never know when it's going to happen right where you are. things that I think about with prescribed fire is that, um, you know, we, we in California have huge areas that need to be managed with fire and we need fire to be restored to these landscapes. Um, the interesting thing is that those areas are so big that prescribed fire is not going to be the only thing that we can use. I think we really need to set our landscape up so that we can let wildfire play its natural role. It's exciting to see that, you know, through the cohesive strategy and, and through local efforts across the country that people are experimenting with new models. And uh, especially here in the Western Klamath Mountains, you know, we're seeing success, you know, building that social license and support for both using prescribed fire at larger scales as well as managing wildfires for resource objectives. And that means sharing liability uh, across all levels, local, tribal, state, and federal levels, um, and, and managing fire together. And we already are through efforts like the Western Climate with Restoration Partnership. Um, and what we came to was basically, you know, fire restoring our historic fire regimes or some semblance of those uh, frequent fires on the landscape is essential for our cultural and community vitality. So when I think about prescribed fire in the wildland urban interface, that's the place we need to be focusing. We need to be putting prescribed fire in strategic locations around communities that enable our wildlands to be more wild and more natural and to have their natural fire regimes. Prescribed fire is a great tool. We can dictate the conditions, we can do it when the weather's right, we can do it when it's really safe, and we can bring fire back into that ecosystem and really get rid of the fuels that are posing the biggest problem for communities and homes. So I think as a homeowner in the WUI, um, prescribed fire is a, our biggest friend and a big tool that we can use and um, make us more comfortable with fire and, and set us up for success. In Cutter Culture, no one owns land. And they own a responsibility to care for the land. And so we're just working through things that's like treks to bring people together and improve people's comfort level with fire. And then that way we can put fire back as people in this place again.
Over here, um, we, you know, this flat's where we perform our world renewal ceremonies. And historically, um, fire was used as part of those ceremonies. And up here on Black Mountain, that fire was lit on the full moon in August. And so an in-season burn was common. And people that lived down here in the valley were safe because we had burned most of the area around the villages where people live now, around where a lot of these private inholdings are now, were burned at least every three years. And so the annual fire behind the, that on, on the landscape would burn into the, that area where people kept burned off and it wouldn't you know, burn down into to the, the homes where people lived. We have a lot of conifer encroachment in our areas where we would like to, um, you know, gather high quality food and fiber resources, medicinal resources, and uh, hunt. Um, and so, you know, and we're getting to the point now to where you've got a lot of that encroachment has built up a lot of fuel that would have burnt regular. Um, it would have burned off every, you know, five to seven or, you know, nine to fifteen years and uh, depending on what what air type of area it's in and so you know we this area did burn in a wildfire in 2013 and it burned at a time of day when you had the up canyon winds blowing right into town and we had identified that a fire start down here as the number one risk to you know the main um, town where people live in Orleans and and um, Sure enough, that that, um, that event and the fire ignition aligned and, and it did blow right into town. And we only lost one home and we did end up catching a fire up behind town there. Um, but it burned at high severity all the way along that hill slope and all the way along um, the ridge system going up out of, out of Orleans. And so we're starting to build frequent fire back in so, so within the next decade or so we can have this whole side of Orleans kind of on a three-year rotation with, um, with maybe some larger landscape on this other side of the river as well. The, the study we published, uh, uh, Alan Taylor and et al. And, uh, on the human influences on fire regimes, and we published it in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences because uh, it was kind of an unusual study. We didn't set out to study human influences on fire regimes. We set out um, to study the influence of climate change on fire regimes. We put the data together for the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades that we had, which was a lot of fire scar records. And then we started running statistical tests against it to compare it to climate change. Uh, we were looking at drought signals, at, at temperature signals, um, and at a number of other indices, and nothing was showing up over the big picture. Over the long period of time, it's like, God, every study we've done, this stuff shows up in. Why doesn't it show up overall as being a big driver of fire regimes? And so then we graphed it all out and we saw, oh, and I'm starting to see that there are changes in what's happening in terms of the fire frequencies and the uh, extent of fires over time. And I'm looking at it and I said, this is people. And boom, these four periods show up as being statistically distinguished from each other. And they coincide with four periods of different types of human land use. Uh, the first period 
which was the longest period, was the Native American period. And the Sierra Nevada, that came to the end, toward the end of the 1700s, because that's when the Spanish influence came in. And you had the Spanish influence up until uh, the gold rush. And then the fire regime changed again during the gold rush and, and the uh, settlement period, the European settlement period. And then comes uh, fire suppression and boom, it really changes again. So we get these four distinct periods that all coincide with major changes in what humans are doing. And so that, that's essentially what we found was that climate was very important within each period. It's just that during the Native American period, there was so much fire going on that you rarely had these very extensive fires over large parts of the landscape. They, they still kind of fell within um, reasonable topographic breaks and that kind of thing. And any particular year didn't seem to be as extensive as it was in after you get the European influence coming in, after the Spanish and then the gold rush and so forth during those periods. And so I think uh, it teaches us that um, working with fire can move you along very positively um, to dealing with uh, a lot of the problems that we have right now, um, both to me, prescribed fire as well as, as managed wildfire. I think that there's been a lot more interest in prescribed fire over the last five years, um, in part because of all the wildfire activity that we have in California, I and mean, we're seeing, you know, pretty extreme fire seasons on a regular basis. And I think folks are looking for solutions and trying to understand how we can, you know, proactively make a difference. So that's one part of it. I also think a big part of it has been um, the work of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council. Um, that group formed. We formed it back in. In 2009 and so we've been working really to elevate these issues and give more um, give more kind of public acceptance to prescribed fire and understanding of, of what a great tool it is and those efforts have paid off I think at a policy level we're seeing more interest in prescribed fire um, at the public level and giving a voice to the managers on the ground who have known this for a long time but just haven't really had that vehicle for spreading the word. So in Humboldt County, I've been working trying to bring a new model for burning um, into our area. And it's something that's really common across a lot of other parts of the country, but it's really a private landowner-led model where land, we're, we're empowering landowners to do prescribed fire projects um, on their own in cooperation with each other and with volunteer fire departments, but really not um, relying on agencies to do the work for them. So this model is called the Prescribed Burn Association model. And um, here in Humboldt County, we're working on forming California's first Prescribed Burn Association, which will really be a collaborative group of landowners and volunteer fire departments and other partners who work together to, to get prescribed fire projects accomplished. The Klamath River Prescribed Fire Training Exchange is unique in that it combines elements of the Prescribed Burn Association model, which was pioneered in the Midwest, ranchers getting together to help each other burn, um, with uh, the, the TREX model, which was created by the U.S. Fire Learning Network, which brings in all of these um, professional resources from around the nation and even internationally to help people get more good fire on the ground and, and burn more complex landscapes. Um, so at the same time that we're building our local capacity with our local volunteer fire departments uh, and through the tribe and, and other NGOs like MICWIC, um, we're also um, providing very high quality training opportunities for people across the country. Um, so overall building our capacity to get more f good fire on the ground more quickly. 
You know, the Klamath Trex is building the capacity both in terms of relationships with our local, tribal, state, and federal partners, but also uh, in uh, building a skilled workforce to actually implement these burns. The structure that we're building of this local incident management team can be used as a, as a resource to manage both prescribed fire and wildfire on this landscape. So the Fire Learning Network is a um, collaboration between the USDA Forest Service, the Department of Interior, and the Nature Conservancy. And it has played a huge role in advancing prescribed fire um, and really getting more fire on the ground in California and throughout the country. Um, so for instance, the TREX model here in Northern California, that's an FLN sponsored um, event and um, one of you know one of the really neat things about the fire learning network is their ability to see strategic opportunities and to make small investments that really change the game. Before we can start managing wildfires in the backcountry for resource objectives, we need to build a social license um, to do that. And, and that means creating fuel breaks around our communities um, that, that gives us that social license. Um, and we've been working at that for the last decade um, in towns like Happy Camp in Orleans where we've defined that place on the landscape uh, where we're going to use manual and mechanical thinning linear treatments that allow us to safely implement prescribed burning from that point towards our communities and then also from that strategic fuel break where we can manage wildfires safely to that point as well. Um, and and uh, ultimately when wildfires come and you know bump up against those prescribed burns you know the community sees that and they really recognize that that uh, having that good black on the ground is essential for um, protecting communities from wildfire we are moving together towards a holistic fire management uh, strategy that can work for you know rural areas across the West